Before I read the text for the sermon this morning, I want to introduce our speaker. Uh, Jared Hall is well known to those of us who have been attending the congregation for any length of time. For those of you who are new and do not know Jared, Jared is a great friend of the congregation. Uh, he has been serving uh, in an advisory capacity to the elders, helping us with planning and strategic thinking over the years. Uh, he is currently serving uh, as the coach of our transition team, and he schleps in all the way from the Quad Cities uh, to be with us. And uh, he is a dad, a husband, uh, he's got three boys, he's a coach, uh, he serves uh, with Moody Bible Institute, Bridal Institute, uh, and there uh, as an uh, area development representative, and uh, he is a, a delightful brother and a good friend. And so uh, I know that he is going to be used of the Lord uh, to uh, feed us this morning. Uh, so as uh, Jared, before Jared comes out, I invite you to open your scriptures to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy, that's the final book, Devarim, uh, the fifth book of the books of Moses. And if you would open to chapter 17, and I will begin reading with verse 14 to the end of the chapter. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. He shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Now it shall come about, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of Levitical priests. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, brother. Shabbat Shalom. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to be here with all of you. Thank you so much, Dan, for the invitation to fill your pulpit. And I would ask before we get started in today's sermon uh, that as we pray that you would also join me in prayer for my wife. As you can imagine, being at home with three boys that are eight, five, and two, although nothing compared to the cooks, it can be a bit challenging. Uh, before I left this morning, my wife had borrowed this marble track from the library that was made of wood but had musical instruments built in. So as the marbles went down, it made little clinking sounds, which is very whimsical when put together. Uh, however, my two-year-old was using uh, the metal blocks to pelt uh, his five-year-old brother who was using his pillow to shield himself. So who knows what's happening right now? Uh, but I'm so grateful for my wife who makes it possible for me to serve in various ministry roles and uh, we actually do have very sweet boys most of the time. But uh, like all of us, they need the Lord to increase, right? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that you are perfect, that you are holy, that you are awesome. And that, Lord, in the midst of a world that seems upside down and crazy, and that there's no path forward, we know, Lord, that you are reigning from your throne. We know, Lord, that in your perfect timing, Messiah will return. 
And so I pray, Lord, that we would not live lives that are hunkered down, that are fearful, but, Lord, that we would live lives that are on mission, that are purposeful, and that, Lord, we take great and wise risks that would please you, that would honor you. And, Lord, in our time together in your word, I pray that we would be students, that we would allow you to speak, allow you to teach us, allow you to instruct us, allow you to sharpen us, Lord, and that at the end of this time together, that we'd be more like Yeshua in the way that we think, in the way that we speak, in the way that we live. It's in his powerful name that we pray. Amen. I want to begin by sharing with you a story about a time I was speaking up in Wisconsin at a youth retreat in the month of February. It was one of the coldest days of the year. It was negative four without wind chill. And we were so far north into Wisconsin that there was actually parts of the Upper Peninsula that was farther south than I was. So we're up there. Now, on the final day of the retreat, it's a Sunday. I need to drive back. It's about a five-hour drive back from this camp to the Quad Cities. It begins to snow just a touch in almost a whimsical, movie-esque, hallmark type of way. You know, the type of snow where if you had a big window and a hot cup of coffee or cocoa, you could just sit there and the whole day would go by and you'd feel great. You know that type of snow? The problem was is that I was in front of a different type of window, my windshield. And at that temperature, it starts to get a little less magical when it starts snowing a little bit faster and doesn't stop. And I made a fatal mistake that day. I trusted my GPS. You see, my GPS was not designed for that snow. My GPS was designed to take me on the fastest route, regardless of what the road conditions were like. So about 30 minutes into this five-hour drive, I'm going down some backcountry roads that don't even have street signs, and they are never getting touched by a plow. Never getting touched by a plow ever. I start to get a little bit nervous because it's really coming down. It's not getting any better. And at one point, I'm going about 25 miles per hour on a 55-mile-per-hour road. It has me cut around a uh, small town and as as I'm going down this country road I see an S curve barely I try to take that S curve ever so gradually and the back of my car starts to fishtail a little bit and then I come out of control and just gently kiss into a snow patch anybody ever been there before yeah yeah so, having never been a Marine, I'm not really prepared for these types of situations, and so I have no shovel, no blankets, no nothing really, except for my ice scraper. It's not a great situation for an ice scraper. But I landed so gently into that snow-packed area that I thought, surely I can just back right out of this. Nope. All I did was spin my tires, and because it was so cold, it quickly created an ice patch where my tires were. So then I got out my scraper and I tried digging out. That was a very ineffective tool, very ineffective tool. And then in this moment, I finally, feeling all of this chaos and concern, thinking, am I going to spend the night out here in this small town? I have no cell signal whatsoever. I mean, it's looking bleak. I look up and right in front of me is this small country house. The driveway, untouched, completely covered with snow, but sitting out in front of their garage is a shovel. Now, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, this is, this is something. So I go down that driveway, their porch completely covered with snow. I knock on the door saying, oh, Lord, please let there's somebody answer that I can just ask for some help. Nobody answers. Nobody answers. Well, now I'm at a crossroads here because that shovel is sitting there. 
so I reasoned to myself that I can surely borrow this shovel. It's not going to really leave their property even and put it back. And so I go and I start shoveling out the car. And as I'm shoveling and shoveling and shoveling, I hear a voice out of nowhere like an angel had arrived. And I looked up and it was a gentleman with his two teenage sons who had muscles and they said, do you need help? I didn't even know they were there. I didn't even hear their car come up. It was like they just appeared out of nowhere. And I said, oh, I would love some help. So I hop in the car. They give me a little push, and I'm free. I'm totally free. I thank them. I go to put the shovel back. And as I turn after leaving the shovel, I hear a, you okay? Which was very startling because I thought I was all alone. And I looked and the door had just ever so cracked to the garage, and I saw these two eyes peering out at me like the Wunzler from the Lorax. And I said, yes, thank you so much for letting me borrow your shovel. He's like, that's what it's there for. And then he shut the door, and that was it. <laughs> and I got back in my car, and I started driving, and I had a decision to make. I could either continue to go on the route that Google had me on, or I could look at the map and go, okay, this is the fastest way to an interstate that's probably more clear than these back roads. And even if it seems to take a little bit longer, it's going to take faster. It's going to be less time. And so I did that. Got back on the interstate. I got home. A five-hour drive became an eight-hour drive. And then I read in the news that on the interstate that I was on that there was a 70-plus car pileup. Had I not followed Google initially, and I would have just taken the fastest route to the interstate, timing-wise, most likely, I would have been in that 70-car pileup. Isn't that wild? I have, the Lord avoided me from a 70-car pileup, and when I did get into a little bit of a sticky situation, he provided a shovel and young men to help get me freed. Isn't that amazing? And then when I did get on the road, I avoided the accident and was able to make it home. Now, for me, that is a testimony of the sovereignty of God's hand that despite my decision making, good or bad, the Lord was able to work it out exactly the way it was supposed to be. The problem is, is that I wasn't very aware of that in the moment. Do any of you have testimonies where you're looking back in Visions 2020, you can go, oh, I saw the Lord and he worked all those pieces out. But when you're in the moment, when you're in the process of making those decisions, it's very hazy. It's very cloudy. It doesn't seem clear. The temptation towards fear and not trust weighs a lot heavier. Fear is much more natural because of our sinful state. And yet, we know that the Lord is able to work these things out in his sovereignty. And so I want to look at a passage today where we see God's sovereign hand, and then I want to see how it applies to our life. So would you open up with me to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. The, as we go to this passage... We're picking up in the start of the kingship of Saul. What has just happened prior to this is that the Israelites have asked Samuel the prophet for a king like the nations. And the reason why I had Pastor Dan read this passage from Deuteronomy 17 is I wanted us to have a picture of what the Lord had set out for what a king should be like in Israel, and then to see what we have in the initial phases of the first king of Israel. So uh, follow along with me. I'm going to start in verse 1, and then we'll make some observations after we, we read the first uh, couple verses. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Veal, son of Zeror, son of the Korath, son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man in the people of Israel who was more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the other people. So let's pause real quick there. 
So what we see here is we're getting the introduction to Saul. This type of introduction would be the systematic formula that the writer of Samuel and Kings would use to introduce all of the other kings. We get this background of his family lineage. We find out that he's the son of Kish. So what do we learn about Saul in these few verses? First we find out that he is the son of a rich kid. Do you see that? Kish is a man of wealth. And so Saul was born into a family of abundance. And with abundance comes resources that were unparalleled to some of his peers. Uh, next we learn that he's very handsome. He's easy on the eyes. Do you see that? He's a handsome young man. There was not a man among them more handsome than he is. He's a stud. That's who he is. He's a wealthy, young, handsome guy. What else do we learn? We learn that he's very tall. He's very tall. And then we finally learn that he's coming from the tribe of Benjamin. Now what's the significance of these things that we learn about him? Well, one, what's interesting is the last time that the tribe of Benjamin is mentioned in the Bible prior to this is in Judges 19 through 21. And if you're not familiar with Judges 19 through 21, it's where the Levite and his concubine have this incident that parallels Sodom and Gomorrah. And the tribe of Benjamin is the tribe that ends up in this situation of being almost extinct from the battle with the rest of the tribes of Israel. So the first king of Israel is coming from this tribe that the last time it's mentioned in the scriptures is in a very negative light. What else do we learn? Well, we know that from the Torah, from Messianic prophecy, that the Messiah is going to come from the tribe of Judah. So there's this anticipation that the kingly line is going to be associated with Judah, but again, this first king is coming from the tribe of Benjamin. Lastly, the fact that he's tall Israelites are never described as tall. It's always people outside of Israel, pagan people, like Goliath, who are described as tall. Isn't that interesting that when the Israelites request a king like the other nations, that the author would then begin to describe Saul as other biblical authors had described the nations? of his height being the key point that stands out there. So here we have this tall, wealthy, rich kid coming from a tribe that has a pretty shaky history so far in Israeli history. Let's see what happens with him. Verse 3. Now, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the young men with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and he passed through the land of uh, Shalisha, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Well, then Saul said to his servant, but if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there's no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again, here. I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. This parenthetical thought now, in verse 9. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Let's pause there and make a few observations. First, the donkeys being missing is not so much like us losing one of our domestic animals like a dog or a cat where there may be some emotional turmoil depending on how uh, 
committed you are to that animal. I had two cats. I was allergic to both of them. I was had very little commitment. But I've met people who are committed to their animals, and that's nice for them. And, you know, if you're missing them, then you put up signs and you offer rewards and you reach out to people. Uh, but in this case, in this context, losing a donkey is not like losing a dog. In this case, it's like losing a tractor, right? You're losing a very expensive, very important piece of making the whole thing work. And so this isn't just like a beloved donkey. This is like losing a $100,000 tractor. So you put your son on it with some help, and this is a big deal. The search is serious. This is a serious deal to go find this donkey, even for a wealthy man. Now, next, you see that parenthetical thought in verse 9 where it says a seer is, uh, they're explaining what a seer is, that it was a prophet. This helps us understand that the author of what I think is Samuel and Kings is writing to a much later audience, giving them background. I would suggest that this is for an audience that had returned from the exile and was concerned about whether or not they had missed the Messiah. And that these books show the history of the monarch of Israel and that nobody had made it. Nobody was the Messiah, so that way the returning Israelites were still looking forward to the coming Messiah instead of being concerned that they missed it. So we have something that's written much later in this time. Now, next, this passage demonstrates the inadequacy of Saul in a variety of ways, some of which are very comical and will continue to be such. Notice first that Saul, who we all know is going to be the future king of Israel, has been given this task to go find some donkeys with help, and can he do it? Nope. Nope. Just think. In a couple chapters, we're going to be introduced to David, and David's a shepherd fighting off wild beasts by himself. Do you see the compare and contrast that the author's doing here? First king can't even find a donkey. Second one can protect sheep. Okay? Two very different men. Next, notice the first words recorded by Saul in the scriptures. There will be a lot of words recorded of Saul, but notice the first words recorded of Saul. Verse 5, come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. Saul presumes that his father must be overcome by worry because he's been gone for a couple days. And so, what does he want to do? He wants to quit. He wants to quit the job because he's inflated in his mind that his father is concerned about him. Do you see that? The first words out of Saul's mouth is, let's quit and go back early. No resolve to finish the task. Let's quit and go back early. There's something always very interesting in biblical narratives of how they use these key words to help us understand the character of the individual. Next, notice this. When he's ready to quit, it's his assistant that tells him about this man of God who is Samuel. Saul has no idea who Samuel is. Just a couple chapters earlier in 1 Samuel 3.20, the author said this, And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. So do you see what the author has done here? He's established early on. Everyone in Israel knows who Samuel is. Everyone knows that he's a prophet. Everyone knows this. And then we get introduced to Saul. And what does he not know? Who Samuel is, right? He doesn't know. Why? It's probably because spiritual things have never mattered. It's probably because following the Lord is not essential. He's never needed the prophet. 
Even though Samuel is on a circuit going around Israel, he's never gone. So he doesn't even know. And then notice this, that when he does find out about him, he says, what should we bring? His presumption is, is that to go and get advice from a prophet is going to require payment. And so what is his presumption? Is a very pagan view of what a prophet is. It's not a biblical view. And then he's the wealthy one, and he says, what do we have? And it's the assistant who says, I'll pay. It's like, the, you've been out to dinner with that guy. What should we leave for a tip? Ah, 15%. Come on. There's a story where Wayne Gretzky taught Michael Jordan how to tip when they were together at a restaurant. Michael Jordan had offered a very small tip to which Wayne said, you can put that away offered a very generous tip, and he said, that's how people like you and me tip. Okay, fella, think about that. Saul has all of these resources, and he goes, ah, we got nothing. And then the assistant takes care of it. Now, verse 11, as they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? And they answered, he is. Behold, he's just ahead of you. Hurry. He has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him. Before he goes up to the high place to eat, for the people will not eat till he comes. Since he must bless the sacrifice, afterward those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Let's pa pause once more. I'm not sure if you've ever realized this, but there's a pattern established in the Torah that people meet their wife at wells. Now, this is probably not good dating advice today to go to your local water plant to meet somebody. I don't think that's how it works anymore, but in the ancient world... Where do we find that uh, Rebecca is found for Isaac? At a well. Jacob and Rachel, well. Moses and Zipporah, well. The well is a love scene that's established in the Torah. Now, here we have a handsome, wealthy, tall guy. He comes to a well with some ladies there. What are we expecting? It's a good time to meet a wife. What does Saul get? Directions. That's what he gets. It's a continued established pattern that Saul does not measure up in all of these various ways. The love scene has been set. The type is there. The author indicates that he's at a well with women, that he's handsome, and guess what? Oh yeah, just go ahead and Go that way, nothing else. Nothing else happens. Verse 15. Now this is very important what happens in these next three verses. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people, because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. It is he who shall restrain my people. This right here is a linchpin into understanding everything that is happening in this narrative. It's an interruption of the narrative. You could read this narrative from verse 14 to verse 18, and it would still make sense. But it would be about Saul and his inadequacy, and the whole thing would appear to be a coincidence. But this interruption here sees that the series of events is not merely a coincidence, but is the sovereign hand of God at work accomplishing not only the request made of the Israelites to instruct them, them that they've requested something foolishly, but also to request the greater means, 
that will bring about David, who will be a man after God's own heart. All of it is under the sovereignty of God. And the narrator, the author, allows us to see that so purely because he's included these verses. Notice what he says. He's given 24-hour advance notice to Samuel that he's going to meet Saul. Now, I think the role of prophet has ceased. I just think that would be convenient sometimes. That's all I'm saying. 24-hour notice, thanks, Lord. You know, hey, tomorrow you're going to get an offender bender. Make sure you have your insurance handy. Thanks, Lord. That's great. Hey, tomorrow you're going to put your foot in the mouth, so have some flowers ready for your spouse. Thanks, Lord. It's not how it works for us. But for Samuel, the Lord is guiding him. And notice Notice this. There's a couple of things that's very interesting. One, uh, it's hard to pick up here in English. It uses the word prince in the Holman version. But that word is not the normal word for king that the Bible uses. It's a word for someone who's subservient to another ruler. And so right here, the Lord is making a point to Samuel, and the author is making a point to us as the reader, is that, Saul is not going to be this king of authority, but rather he's just going to be an instrument used for this purpose of protecting the Israelites from the Philistines. He's going to serve in that capacity for a limited time, and that's it. But notice this very important point. Notice the number of times that the Israelites are referred to by the Lord as my people. As my people. There is a key direct ownership that the Lord wants to make very clear. That he is the king. He is the one in charge. And that's why he's the one that gets to direct the steps. Finally, as we close the chapter. Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, tell me where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place. For you today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjamite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? And then Samuel took Saul and his young men and brought him into the hall and gave him a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So this cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, see what was kept is set before you. Eat because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day, and when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. And then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul rose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us. And he was passed on, Stop here yourself for a while, that I make known to you the word of God. And that's where the chapter ends. What's going to happen immediately into the next chapter is that what Samuel has been alluding to in this whole interaction of the question, this rhetorical question that he asked to him in verse uh, 20 when he says, and for whom is that all is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saying you're going to be this most important person. He's alluding to it. When he gives him the position at the head of the table at this meal, it's alluding to his importance. When he prepares a place for him to sleep on the roof, and I understand that without context, giving Saul a bed on the roof does not seem very complimentary. But in the ancient Near East, that's a very enjoyable place to sleep. It's much more cool than being inside of the house. This was a good place to sleep. So he gives him a premier place to sleep. So all of it's being alluded to. And then immediately into the next chapter, he's going to make it very clear. He's going to anoint him that he's going to be the next king, or the first king of Israel. And so, 
as we close this chapter, what do I want us to see? Notice that although the Israelites have asked for a king like the nations, and they ought not to ask for it, the Lord's still at work in that. He's going to protect them from the Philistines, but they're also going to have the consequences of their prayers answered. Because their request was not a request made out of faith, right? That's why I had Pastor Dan read that passage. Because Israel could have asked for a king and said, Lord, will you give us a king like described in Deuteronomy 17, who is going to love your law, who is going to write your law out, who is going to meditate on your law, who is going to follow your ways in all of his ways? No, that's not what they said. They said, give us a king like the nations. Why? Because they knew that Samuel was getting older, Samuel's sons were not like Samuel, and it had worked with Samuel. The Lord had worked through Samuel. The Lord had protected him through Samuel. But with Samuel getting older and no clear person to take his role next, they got scared. And so they said, Lord, give us a king like the nations. And the Lord is at work in both answering their prayer, but also giving them ultimately what they need, which is a pathway to David. And this is what I want you to see. The Lord is unbound in his ability to interrupt and to direct. The Lord is unbound in his ability to interrupt and to direct. So often in our life, we're looking at our circumstances in a very horizontal sense. And it seems like, well, I see this path and I see this path. I don't see any other path, so it's going to be this or it's going to be this. And the reality is in that in God's economy, this being God's world, God can interrupt at any time, in any way, and direct as he wants to. And we need to have confidence and trust in that. You see, the Israelites said, well, if we're losing Samuel, then the only other option is for us to have a king. There was a different option, and that was to continue in faithfulness and see what the Lord provided instead of coming up with the solution and, tell, and then demanding that solution. Saul is an incompetent person to be the king, yet the Lord is still going to be able to work through him and still bring about David and still bring about the Messiah. None of it gets interrupted in the Lord's ultimate economy because the Lord is never bound by what appears to be the limitations of our circumstances. And so this is what I want to encourage us with today. As we go through life, when we are tempted with fear to choose faith, when we are tempted with fear to choose faith. To never, ever limit the Lord based upon what we see. It's open-handed living. It's what it is. It's living based on trust. And so I want to apply it very specifically to this season of life for the congregation of Olive Tree. Nobody would have planned that for Pastor Dan and Cynthia to reach this season of ministry, for us to be in the midst of a global pandemic with a governor who's been operating on emergency powers for 18 months, it's not the story we would have written, right? Right? And the temptation is to choose fearful response. Well, what's going to happen? What are we going to do? How is it going to work? Or what's going to, is this going to be it? What are we going to do? Who are we going to get? Can Cynthia stay and Dan still leave? Can we do that? <laughs> but we have to choose trust. You see, the Israelites were looking at this idea of having a king like the nations because they seemed to be able to keep the boundaries of their land. And so they thought, surely that would be enough for us. If we just had someone to fight our battles. And what I want you to know is that for Dan and Cynthia who love you, what they really are are two people who for the last 30 plus years have simply said to the Lord, Lord, we want to be your vessel. 
And so as you prayerfully live life in this congregation through an impending transition, the prayer should not be, Lord, give us Dan and Cynthia 2.0. That should not be the prayer. That would be a fearful prayer. The faithful prayer is this, Lord, give us a man and a woman who desire to be your vessel above all else, willingly, willingly. Because here's the secret. Everyone ends up being a vessel of the Lord in his sovereignty. Some are willing and some are not. Saul is the Lord's vessel, unwillingly so. David is the Lord's vessel, willingly so. So I want to encourage you that through this time that we would lean in to faith and trust in the Lord and prayerfully continue to petition the Lord, not out of fear, oh, what are we losing, but to say, Lord, we desire for a man and a woman who are willingly seeking to be your vessel and see what the Lord does and to see what the Lord does. Let me close with this story about the sovereignty of God. There's a former president of Asbury College. His name was Dennis Kinlaw. In his uh, graduate years, he had gone to a university called Brandeis uh, in Massachusetts, about 20 minutes from Boston. When Dennis was going through his seminary, uh, he had to take a course. And the course was called Islamic History, Law, and Theology, which for some people may be very exciting. However, Dennis was abysmal at uh, Arabic, and so every day was a bit torturous and a lesson in humility for him. However, there was an upside to this very painful course. And the upside was is that he got to be the chauffeur for the guest lecturer. And so every day he would drive this man, Joseph de Samogi, from Boston to Brandeis because Joseph served as the, um, the librarian of uh, Semitic languages at Harvard. And so Dennis, as he was driving Joseph, every day got to learn Joseph's story. You see, Joseph wasn't an American. Uh, Joseph was originally from Hungary. When Joseph was in Hungary, he was a college professor. He was an Old Testament scholar. And during his tenure at this college, Nazism was on the rise in Hungary. They were making inroads there. And so, being a devout Christian, Joseph would leave his Hebrew Bible open on his desk. So right there on his desk is Hebrew, right there, right there. And his co-workers would come in, these other professors, and they'd go, is that, is that a Bible? And he'd say, yes. And they'd go, is that Hebrew? And he'd go, yes. That's very Jewish said, yes, we serve a Jewish Savior. And he said, the Nazis are not going to like that. And he said, I don't care. I, wanted, I care about what the Lord cares about. So he was very outspoken, kind of brash, willing to take risks for the Lord. And then one day, at his home, he hears, opens the door, and it's a police officer. And the police officer tells him that in a couple hours, he's going to be returning here with two Gestapo agents. And he says this, I would appreciate if you would disappear. So Joseph takes his life work, this scholarly manuscript, he runs off and hides in an orchard, and he takes his dissertation, and he buries it in the ground in hopes that one day Nazism will pass, and he'll be able to take his work back out and continue life. Well, for the next uh, several years, 
he would return, or he would spend his life on the run, out in the very remote country area, asking people to host him for a night or two, until eventually Nazism completely died off. And so he was able to go back, take his manuscript out, return back to his work, but as soon as he returned back to work, the Soviet Union took off into Hungary. And so again, he was facing persecution. Now, because of his outspoken beliefs and for being a strong believer, the government had put him on their short list of people that they wanted to put into their prison in Siberia. Now listen, if the Soviet Union wanted to put you in a prison in Siberia, it's because they never wanted you to come back. That's a place that you go to die. So, as a response to that, he was working very hard to get a visa so he could travel to Vienna to a conference and hopefully find his way out of this situation. However, his visa kept getting denied over and over and over again. And so finally, he decided to go down to the main office that handled all of the visa applications, and he was going to try to confront them right then and there to get this accomplished. And as he walked into the building, he felt himself so enraged and so angry that he decided, you know what, I better not take the elevator because if I go up there as steaming hot as I am, being a guy on the S Siberia list, I'm probably going to get there faster. So he decides to take the stairs so he can cool off a little bit. As he's going up the stairs, he bumps into one of his former students. And he said, what are you doing here? And he said, the student said, I'm engaged to the assistant of the guy who's the head of the deciding who gets visas. He said, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm trying to get a visa to Vienna so I can escape this country. And his former student said, is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> well, can you get me a meeting? He said, let's do it. So they go upstairs together this young man goes to his fiance, explains the situation of his beloved professor and the impending doom waiting for him and that he needed this visa to get out of the country. And the woman looked at him and said, I can't get you a meeting with him. Do you know what will happen to me? This guy's on the Siberia list. No way. And the young man looked at her and said, listen, you get him a meeting or the marriage is off. So he got a meeting, and he got a visa, and he got to Vienna. And when he gets to Vienna, he has a conversation with one of his peers who works in England about trying to get a job. And the professor says to him, I do not have a position worthy of your skill set right now. However, I can give you a stipend that will keep you alive until you can get somewhere else. Can you imagine that? Another university is going to give him a stipend to live on, even though he's not doing any work for them. And that stipend gets him enough time to where he can get hired in Harvard and make his way to the United States. So as they finished that car ride that day, Dennis is a changed man as he listens to Joseph's story. Because Joseph was a man whose entire life had been beautifully and gracefully interrupted by the sovereignty of God. Everything changed from the cops showing up at his house and giving him warning to people providing for him as he hid in the country, to bumping into a student as he took the stairs because he was so heated that he didn't take the elevator, to arriving in Vienna and having another, another university pay him a livable wage until he left. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the Lord that we serve. 
this is the Lord that we can trust. And this is the Lord that we pray to. Will you join me now? Father, we ask that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that, Lord, we would always choose faith over fear, and that, Lord, you would bless the leadership of Olive Tree, and that, Lord, you would raise up the next congregational leader, that this man would love you with all of his mind, with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength. We pray this in the powerful name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen.